third canto, chapter 26, which is called, I forget what the chapter's called, but um, text 51 will be today, and I will start with Jai Rada Madhava. Okay. Jai Rada Madhava. Kunja Bihari Jai <laughs> Shri Vandavandam ki jai, Navadweet Mahapodam ki jai, Gangamai ki jai, Yamunamai ki jai, Tulasi Devi Maharani ki jai, Samaveda Bhaktivinoda ki jai. All glories to all the assembled devotees, all glories to all the assembled devotees, all glories to Sri Sri Guru and Sri Goranga, all glories to Sri La Prabhupada. <clears throat> Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya 
Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya Okay. Excuse me, I think I might have been silent just now, so I might just do the verse again. Sorry about that. I'll just go through once per each line. Um, yeah, sorry about that. <coughs> okay. Um, just put a comment if you can hear now. Tatas te nanu ve de bio. Yukte bion dam achetanam. Yukte bion dam achetanam. Uti tam purusho yasmad. Udatish tad aso virat. Udatish tad aso virat. Okay. Apologies about the sound. I forgot to click one button to make sure that you could hear. All right, let's continue to the word by word. <clears throat> Tataha, then. Tena, by the Lord. Anu vidabhya, from these seven principles. Roused into activity. Yuktebhya, united. Andam, an egg. Achetanam, unintelligent. Utitam arose. Purushaha, cosmic being. Yasmat, from which Udatishtat appeared. Asal, that. Virat, celebrated. Translation From these seven principles, roused into activity and united by the presence of the Lord, an unintelligent egg arose, from which appeared the celebrated cosmic being. Purport by His Divine Grace A.C. Bhaktivedanta Swami Srila Prabhupada. <clears throat> In sex life, the combination of matter from the parents, which involves Emulsification and secretion creates the situation whereby a soul is received within matter, and the combination of matter gradually develops into a complete body. <clears throat> the same principle exists in the universal creation. The ingredients are present, but only when the Lord enters into the material elements is matter actually agitated. That is the cause of creation. We can see this in our ordinary experience. Although we may have clay, water and fire, 
The elements take the shape of a brick only when we labor to combine them. Without the living energy, there is no possibility that matter can take shape. Similarly, this material world does not develop unless agitated by the Supreme Lord as the Virat Purusha. Yasmad Uda Tishtad Aso Virat. By his agitation, space was created and the universal form of the Lord also manifested therein. <clears throat> so let's read the verse and translation again. Tatas tena nuvitebhyo yoktebhyon dama chetanam Uti tam purusho yasmad udatish tadaso virat. From these seven principles, roused into activity and united by the presence of the Lord, <clears throat> an unintelligent egg arose, from which appeared the celebrated cosmic being. Oh, Magyana Tamaranda Sahaganjana Shalaka. Just interesting, this one particular word here. Um, Achetanam, which means the opposite of Chetanam, um, which has a few different meanings. One particular meaning is life force, like the word Chaitanya, Lord Chaitanya. Um, it means the living force. It comes from the same root word, chaitana, consciousness. Prabhupada often used to like quoting one verse, chaitanas chaitana nam um, yavada dati kaman, that all of the living beings are maintained by the original living being. In this particular case, it's um, saying the opposite, unintelligent means to say that this is uh, inert matter, uh, not conscious. So I'll just hide the verses for a moment and um, say a few words. There we go. So in this particular um, purport, in particular, Prabhupada is focusing on a key point here. And it's a point which he would emphasize many times, and that is that life comes from life. Not that life comes just by the combination of matter, material elements. Life um, exists when there's a favorable combination of material elements, and then the life is injected. So in this particular case, He's talking about, in the purport, how the womb of the mother is a favorable um, place, a favorable environment for the uh, embryo to grow. And so then the seed is implanted there by the father and the embryo grows and, until it becomes a full grown child. <clears throat> In the same way, when we plant a seed in the ground, there is the fertile earth, and planting the seed there um, allows the conditions for life to exist, but it's not happening independently. When the conditions are favorable, then by the mercy of the Lord, the living entity is able to um, enter into that situation and provide the life force, Chaitanam, that allows the growth to happen. Just like the difference between animate and inanimate is a similar sense. Animate means moving so something, or, or having life. So something cannot move unless it has life. And Prabhupada's expanding this here as well to say that even material things like a brick, a brick in itself does not have consciousness. And therefore, um, it doesn't move doesn't do anything. 
And uh, he's using the example to say that there's these different elements that make up a brick. There's the fire, well, let's say the, the clay and the water. And then when combined with fire, there's a transformation that makes this um, form of a brick. Very simple type of technology. But without that intelligent person who's putting their life force and life energy into the creation of this brick, it's not going to happen by itself. And we can see this in so many different um, different things. This is one of the primary arguments um, for the existence of God that we can see in everything around us, whether it's living or not living, that it has its origin in something living. So we can take the classic example, which is the watch. If you walk down the road and you find a watch lying in the street and you pick it up and look at it, you're not going to think that, oh, accidentally, somehow or other, a bunch of um, elements have bumped together and it accidentally created this watch. An insane person might think that, but a normal person would think, wow, look at the craftsmanship of this watch. This is an amazing thing. Look at all the pieces and all of the um, way that everything fits together. This is an incredible product of someone's intelligence, as it's mentioned in this um, verse. It's very interesting how Prabhupada translated that word, achetanam, to mean unintelligent, and chetanam to mean intelligent. So this is one of the symptoms of consciousness, is intelligence. And so we look at this watch, we think, wow, this is an amazing um, construction. Now, a watch is a very simple thing. What to speak of um, the world? I mean, even if you go in, they say, even if you look inside one um, cell, it is so complex. You know, we can't even see it, but if you go in with a microscope and you look really closely, you can see that there's so many intricate um, arrangements and interactions that allow a cell to function. So this is called the argument by design or the intelligent design theory. And it's very interesting. I was just studying up on it this morning about the history of um, education and in, in, in related to this idea. So in 1920, I'm not sure what happened prior to that, but at nine, in 1920, they actually banned the teaching of evolution from schools in America. And um, so that was quite interesting um, because they were saying that it's, you know, not proven and I don't know, unscientific or else basically maybe people in those days were more religious and they just didn't like the idea of it. Um, but then in the sixties, um, they reintroduced the theory of evolution into schools and at the same time, they had this idea of um, intelligent design. They called it creation science to say that um, ultimately God created everything. And that has to be taught along with the rest of the science curriculum. However, I think it was in the 80s, um, they overturned, well, they, they made another decision to say that you cannot teach creationism creation science, as they called it, or as it was renamed, um, intelligent design. And the argument was that it's not scientific, which is interesting. Of course, it depends how you define science. Prabhupada said that this is the science of self-realization, this Krishna conscious process. So it all comes down to definitions, and the definition of science, which was um, established way back when, I, I did read about it just now, but it's a blur. I can't remember exactly who came up with this definition, but at some point in time, it was decided that when we talk about science, it cannot include any supernatural elements. It can only include the elements that we're able to um, see with our material senses, essentially. So as soon as we talk about creation, 
by an intelligent designer, it automatically includes a supernatural element, which is God, that God created the world. And therefore they said, no, I'm sorry, we can't accept that. Science means we can only talk about the things that we can actually see, hear, taste, touch, and smell. Which is kind of interesting because many of the theories that they propose, that meaning the atheistic scientists who don't accept the principle of God, their theories are also quite supernatural in the sense that when you go back to the original state, like where did everything come from? It always comes back to what they call singularity. There's always this one point. So the scientists or the atheists, they come back to some kind of mythical period where something came from nothing. Now, if that's not supernatural, what is? Right? If you go to a magician's show and then poof, he creates this, you know, this bird out of a hat, he's created something out of nothing, apparently. That's called supernatural, right? And so how can the scientists propose these kinds of um, theories while not allowing the principle that perhaps beyond matter there is a supernatural cause. In Krishna consciousness, that's one of the definitions of God. Sava karana karanam. The cause of all causes. Whenever you trace the cause of something back, you come to God. And so if we look at the sun principle here in terms of life, like I have a father and a mother, and they had a father and a mother. And if we continue on, we'll find that every living being has a father and a mother or some living being as its source. Just like a tree, when you chop a branch from a tree and replant it, the origin of the new tree is the original tree. So maybe there's just one parent, so to speak. But you'll always find that if there's life, that life has come from another life. It's never the case that life comes from matter. And if you keep tracing back, so, okay, my parents and their parents and their parents, ultimately you'll come to the original cause of all causes, and that is Krishna. That is God. So the um, education system today suffers from a big problem that they've limited their um, sphere of um, investigation and therefore they've limited their um, they've actually ruled out certain options that may be true and we, we've seen as we've just exp explained here that life comes from life so if they're not going to look at spirit which is another name for life and only look at matter, they'll never find what they're looking for. There was one great scientist, I forget what his name is, um, and I believe it's a quote in the Origins magazine. He was saying that as we went deeper and deeper to study biology, and we went down to the molecules and, the, and um, the smaller and smaller level, somehow or other, that life that we were trying to find just disappeared. You know, we were not able to find it. There's a, a great story um, I may have told before. It's, I think it's one of the Bebel and Akbar stories where you, you can probably find an Amachatra Kata, where Emperor Akbar, for some reason, he wanted to find three foolish people. He said, Bebel, go and find me three foolish people. And just as a side note, it's very interesting that this Akbar, you know, we hear about Bebel and Akbar, in these stories is actually a historical personality and i've been studying up about the temples in vrindavan because i'm in the process of creating a video about that for bhakti learning and when i was reading up about the history of the temples in vrindavan it's amazing that the goswamis actually met akbar akbar had heard of the goswamis and so he came and he met the goswamis even though he's obviously you know from a 
Muslim culture. He met the Goswamis and he had an experience, a spiritual experience, by the mercy of the Goswamis. And he was so inspired that he actually funded the building. First of all, he gave the permission to build the temples because that at that time, um, at that time, sorry, I was close to the curtain, it's getting a bit right back there. At that time, uh, North India was under the rule of the uh, Muslims. And so um, they needed the permission of the, you know, the ruler who was Akbar. So he gave them permission to build the um, Govinda, Gopinath, Madan Mohan, and one other temple, I think uh, Radhavalaba temple. So he gave permission, but not only that, he actually donated the best um, sandstone to build the temples, which was um, previously only used for the, um, you know, the Mughal emperors. So very interesting that this Akbar actually um, helped to build these temples in Vrindavan. Um, so anyway, getting back to the story. So Akbar and Bebo. And um, interesting. Yeah. So this story of Bebo and Akbar. Find me three foolish people. So I'll just talk about uh, one of them at this particular point. I can, I, I can remember the second one and the third one I can't remember. In any case. Bebel's out walking and thinking, where can I find a foolish person? So as he's walking, it's at night, and he finds someone who's underneath a street lamp. So he goes up to that person and he says, have you lost something? Can I help you? And the person said, yeah, I've lost the key for my house. Dropped it. And so um, Bebel, he was like, okay, let me see if I can help you. And he was um, looking around with this person next to him, looking for the key. And then he just thought to ask, whereabouts did you drop it? And then the um, this foolish person, <laughs> he said, oh, yeah, I dropped it over there in the shadows, over there, you know, under that tree over there. So Bear was like, Wait a minute, you dropped it over there and you're looking over here. Why are you looking here if you dropped it over there? And the foolish man said, Oh, because the light is much better here. So this sounds quite foolish. And of course, it is foolish. But this is what the scientists, the atheistic scientists, are doing because they're not comfortable with things beyond their senses because they're not comfortable with anything supernatural then they're just choosing to ignore that aspect and not try to explore those things but rather just focus on what they know even though the answer to their questions does not lie there it's also very interesting here um, when Drew Dekama Prabhu was here, he was explaining how many scientists in previous times were very interested in supernatural matters, you know, such as alchemy, which is not spiritual, but it's something a little bit, um, a little bit sort of esoteric and a little bit more subtle than, you know, what's accepted as science today. And there was a fellow by the name of Oh, what was his name? The Darwin. It'll come to me what his name is. Um, hopefully when my family in the other room who are watching me on TV hear this, they might remember the name of that person. But there was this person who, at the same time that Darwin was coming up with his theory of evolution, which was called the, um, the theory of evolution by natural selection. So there was another person who, independently of Darwin, came up with the same kind of concept that um, the different species of life uh, adapt to their environment and that over time they can create into different species. That's the basic concept. 
So this person, Wallace, got it. I think his name was Charles Wallace. Anyway, Wallace was the surname. So this person wrote to Darwin and said, because Darwin was, you know, quite a respected person in the scientific community at the time, before he published the um, theory of evolution by natural selection. So this person wrote to Darwin, because um, he was a lot younger, this Wallace, he wrote to Darwin and said, I've got this idea. What do you think? Do you think it's a, it's a good theory? You know, what's your um, concept? So you can imagine if you were in Darwin's position, it'd be kind of interesting because, you know, scientists are looking to see how they can become famous by creating a new theory. So Darwin had a few options here. One option was that he could um, just pretend that he never read that letter and just go ahead and advertise that, yes, I've come up with the Darwinian theory of evolution by natural selection. Um, or he could work together with this other person and create the theory and advertise it as a joint theory, which is actually what he chose to do to his credit. So it was actually known as the Darwinian Wallace um, theory of natural selection, a uh, theory of evolution by natural selection. They both shared the name of this theory. But then what happened over time is that this Wallace fellow, he was a true scientist. He wanted to understand how everything worked, not just, um, you know, the mainstream kind of dogmatic viewpoint of science. In fact, um, uh, Isaac Newton was also of this character, um, had this characteristic. You know, Isaac Newton, he believed in intelligent design and he was also studying alchemy, not because he wanted gold, but because he had this curiosity to understand how everything works, you know, the mind of a scientist. So Wallace was like that. And what he was curious about is some of these psychic phenomena. So, for example, there was this guy who was able to play a harmonium um, just by holding one side of it, and by his energy, he could make the harmonium play an incredible tunes just by touching it, you know, like, He'd put his hand in a box and do it. And in fact, he could even make the harmonium float in space and play without even touching it. And so Wallace, he, he was studying these phenomena and he would, you know, put the person in a cage and, you know, put some very clear scientific um, boundaries in place to prove, you know, that this phenomena was a real um, thing. But because of the scientific bias against supernatural, um, the supernatural, he wasn't looked upon very kindly by the scientific community. So the harmonium was just one example of the sort of things that he was studying. You know, he would study about ghosts and uh, ESP and the kind of things that I used to read about in the Unexplained magazine when I was a kid. Um, but because the scientific community didn't didn't really approve of these types of investigations. They wanted to just pretend they didn't exist. So they actually, in one sense, they wrote Wallace out of the will. They took his name away from the Wallace Darwinian theory of evolution by natural selection, and it just became the Darwinian theory of evolution. So this is just a, an example of how in the scientific community, there, there's a very narrow viewpoint about what science means. And it's not really um, opening up to other possibilities. You know, just like the big topic of the day recently has been conspiracy theories. And you essentially have two groups of people. You've got the people who blindly accept the mainstream narrative as it's as the conspiracy theorists like to call it. Um, and they like to call those people sheeple because they're just like sheep. They're not thinking, they're just following the crowd. And then ironically, you also have on the other side, uh, equally, um, what's the word, blind followers 
who blindly accept any conspiracy theory that comes along um, out of distrust of whatever the mainstream view is, that if anyone provides an alternative view, that must be true because we can't trust the mainstream media. So in both cases, there is a, um, a narrowing of the view. You know, it's limiting our view that it's either this way or it's this way. But instead, we want to really develop this idea of broad-mindedness and not just accepting things um, from one point of view, but really trying to analyze things and understand the arguments behind them. And that's what Srila Prabhupada was doing. I was listening to the podcast uh, Wisdom of the Sages yesterday, and uh, Kostuba Prabhu was talking about when Tamal Krishna Maharaj and uh, Ridananda Maharaj and some other devotees were on the morning walk with Prabhupada. Prabhupada would present these arguments. He wanted the devotees to be solid in their logic and their reasoning. Um, and when he would ask a question, he would say, so this is, what do you think of this idea? What, what, what's your comment? And then the devotee would say, oh, no, that's not true because in the Bhagavad Gita it says whatever, whatever. And Prabhupada says, okay, don't talk of Bhagavad Gita. If I don't accept the Bhagavad Gita and you say it's in the Bhagavad Gita, it doesn't help me. What's your real argument? You know, use your logic. Use your reason. And so Prabhupada wanted us to have that. He didn't want us to just blindly follow for, for several reasons. One, it helps us to be strong in our conviction ourselves, but also it helps us to um, convince others. People are not just going to blindly accept Bhagavad Gita. They have to say, oh, is it sound? Is there logic behind it? Okay. So this is the limitation of modern science, is that they do not allow the consideration of any supernatural um, phenomena. It has to all be explainable in terms of matter, what we can see, hear, feel, taste, touch, and smell. And therefore, they are being like the foolish man who is trying to look only where the light is, where they feel comfortable, and not actually looking where the answer will really be found. Okay, I have a couple more points here, so let's have a quick look here. Um, so, yeah, if we look at intelligent design, we can just go into it a little bit further as well. <clears throat> um, if anyone has any questions, now would be a good time to type it in, because there's usually a little bit of a delay, and it would good to be good if there's some questions that um, we can discuss. Or points that you'd like to raise up, raise. Um, yeah. So if someone doesn't accept that there's God behind the living, uh, behind this universe, then what alternatives are there? And ultimately, it just comes out to randomness. You know that um, something just happened for no reason. So this doesn't also doesn't um, line up with the concept of science. Science is about the study of laws. We observe that things follow a consistent pattern in our life. We see that when we drop something, it goes down. It's called, they call it gravity. You know that every day the sun rises at a specific time. The moon follows a specific sequence. Uh, the human body has a particular way of growing and, and then dying. So we see so many um, consistent patterns in the life that we see. So the concept of randomness just doesn't make sense. And the whole idea of science doesn't make sense. If everything's random, then there is no science. And if there is science, that means that we're recognizing patterns and we're seeing uh, principles and laws at pl in place. And that can only be because there's a lawmaker. How can there be laws without a lawmaker? It just doesn't make sense. Um, you know, when you look at how people behave, there's a certain pattern. And it's just like um, 
if someone was to create a video game and they wanted to recreate what happens in the world, they'll do it by establishing certain um, guidelines, certain uh, logic by which the game is played. And so we see that in this world, things are following a logic. They're following patterns. They're following laws. Things are not happening randomly. And therefore, um, it implies that there's a lawmaker. Even if we take the idea of evolution, you know, the atheistic concept of evolution, that one species adapts to its environment and then um, morphs into a different species. If we take this level of um, thinking. So we can see in our experience that, yes, living beings do adapt to their environment, although I have not heard of any example of one species changing to another. However, even if this theory is accepted, um, it's still working upon the basis of laws and principles. That if we suppose we accept this theory of evolution, then who created those principles by which that evolution is taking place? Because we're talking about something which is not acting randomly, although it's supposedly random mutations. But this principle of survival is a principle. Where did that come from? So, of course, um, generally, this is not a very good argument, uh, this evolutionary theory. An alternative, so people might say, well, evolution is what the scientists are telling us. What's your alternative? Well, although it's outside the realm of modern science because it involves a supernatural force, in other words, intelligence, which is you know, lacking in modern science, we just accept that there's an intelligent creator who's created uh, different beings. And they'll say, oh, but can't you see that, you know, there's these lower forms of life and the higher forms of life, they're quite similar, but they're a little bit different. Well, isn't that how an intelligent person will design something? An intelligent person is not going to just randomly create all these things that are totally different from each other. Look at cars. The first car was created and then the intelligent designer said, okay, that's good. I like that car. Now let's make another car. Just like Tesla, they've got three models, right? They all have four wheels, they all have electric motors, but they're designed for a different purpose. One's a racing car, well, there's, there's four models now, I guess. There's the racing car, which is the, uh, the roadster. And then there's kind of like the, the sort of regular sedan. And then there's the family car, the Model X. And now you've got this um, Cybertruck. So they've all got four wheels, they've all got electric motors, all have a steering wheel and so many common elements, but they've been adapted to serve a different purpose. And they're all cars, for that matter. So it's not surprising that if there's an intelligent creator, that there'll be commonalities between the different living beings. Just because um, there's similarities between species doesn't mean that they evolve by evolution. Rather, it shows the intelligence of the designer that why totally reinvent the wheel every time? Use, a, use um, the template you've got and modify it. Makes sense to me. Um, and then the other um, problem with the evolutionary theory is that it violates the law of thermodynamics. The law of thermodynamics in fact, no, this is not just um, the theory of evolution, but the whole concept that life can arise from matter is this thermodynamics principle, which is that if you take something um, and you leave it, then what will happen over time is that the energy level will go down um, and it will become more disarrayed. These are the two things that tend to happen. And if one of the things doesn't happen, it's because the opposite one. For example, if you, um, yeah, just the just general principle of these two things. If you put something on the top of the hill, then over time it will probably fall down to the bottom of the hill. It goes to a lower energy state. And if something is very um, complex, 
you'll find that over time it becomes um, broken down and becomes in disarray. It takes energy to maintain order. If you don't believe me, check out my office. Check out my bedroom. <laughs> this is proof that without conscious effort, things become disarrayed. Um, so yeah, this, this is another principle of science, the law of thermodynamics, that things will either become more disordered or go to a lower energy state. Um, but the theory that life comes from matter is to say that we've got all this disorder, all these elements just in disarray, and suddenly they become in a complex form at a higher energy level. It totally contradicts the theory of conservation of energy and thermodynamics. The only way that that can happen is if there's an input from a living living force. And that's the point of this purport today. Um, ingredients provided. Yeah, not only that, um, if we, Prabhupada would challenge the scientists. If you say that life comes from matter, you have the matter. Now create life. They can't even create one atom. Not even one virus, or can it? Anyway, that, the point is that um, the most simple thing, the most simple form of life is beyond the capability of the scientists who are so proud of their knowledge and their technology. And even the, the principle, you know, like I said, make a virus. If someone makes a virus, how do they do it? They do it by modifying an already existing living being. Again, life comes from life. And again, it's someone using their intelligence to make this happen. Whatever we create is because the material elements are there, given by Krishna. So the elements are given by Krishna, and the intelligence by which we can modify those things is also given by Krishna. So all around, we're totally dependent on God. And God allows us you know, the reason we're in this world is we're here to forget him. So he allows us to um, think that we're independent. But when we analyze things, we see this is not really the case. So I think I've covered the main points here. Um, yeah, so just to recap what this verse is speaking about, it's saying about this material world is... Um, assembled all the material elements are assembled and then the living force is um, allowed to enter and manifest um, life and form activity just as when the material combination of the sperm and the egg comes together then the living being um, because it's a environment where life is can be sustained the living being is put there and then the force of that living entity allows the growth to come from there and this is proof that um this is preserving this thermodynamics theory because energy has come from a spiritual source and therefore it appears that this matter is growing on its own So we have this whole material world, which is like Mother Earth, or Mother Nature. And the father is Krishna. Krishna puts the energy into the material world, and everything happens. So in the spiritual world, we have the, all the Vaikuntha planets. And in one corner of the spiritual world, we have this um, the shadow, the material nature. And inside this material nature, Lord Krishna expands as Mahavishnu, and he's existing there. And from his body, so many little universes are coming out, and he's injecting his energy into these universes, these um, you know, unconscious eggs, <laughs> and he's giving them life to live. And when he glances over that material energy, um, the personification of that glance is Lord Shiva, Sadashiva. So that's why sometimes Sadashiva is... Uh, like Advaita Acharya is considered an incarnation of Sadashiva. He's sometimes compared as Mahavishnu and sometimes as Lord Shiva. And that's because um, 
Sadashiva is the incarnation or the personification of the glance of Mahavishnu entering into the material world. So simultaneously, um, Mahavishnu and Lord Shiva, who's the um, father of the material world, you could say. So I'll stop there and um, see if anyone has any questions or any comments you can add to the chat. We can expand the conversation. So while you're um, thinking of any comments, because I have this little technology here, I thought we would share one little video about Darwin, uh, Darwinian theory. So I'll just uh, load it up here. Just a little bit of humor to uh, Okay, so just a little humor to end the class there, and I'll just um, we'll put the verse back on and hide my face for a second. So we can just, oops, wrong one, hide my face, here we go, and we'll just read the verse in purple one more time, so, um, Tatas, tatas te nanu vidde bhyo yokte bhyo nan ta chetanam utitam purusho yasmat utta tishtadu salvirat Translation, from these seven principles aroused, uh, so aroused into activity and united by the presence of the Lord, an unintelligent egg arose from which appeared the celebrated cosmic being. All right, so we'll just end here. And um, thank you for listening and attending and look forward to we look forward to another class tomorrow. Hare Krishna.